The jury has resolved to grant the BBVA Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Award in the Ecology and Conservation Biology category in its 14th edition to the following candidates. Lenore Farig, the Chancellor's Professor of Biology at Carleton University in Canada. Simon Levin, the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Princeton University in the United States. And Stuart Pickett, the Distinguished Senior Scientist at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies in Millbrook, New York, also in the United States. We are delighted to recognize Lenore Farig, Simon Levin, and Stuart Pickett for their outstanding efforts to bring theory and order to the complexity of studying and managing coupled human natural systems. In a landmark 1992 paper, Simon Levin wrote, the problem of pattern and scale is the central problem in ecology, unifying population biology and ecosystem science and marrying basic and applied ecology. Each of this year's award winners has devoted their life to the study of this central problem both in developing the theory and mathematics of spatial ecology and applying that theory to design criteria for reserve areas, wildlife management plans, sustainable road networks, and cities. Their work has been grounded in ecological theory, explicitly acknowledging the spatial dimensions and scales of organism interactions and the critical importance of habitat connectivity for the movement of organisms, propagules, and materials across complex landscapes. All three scholars are notable for their remarkable intellectual breadth and depth the ease with which they have built collaborations with the diverse scholars and stakeholders, and their facility in fostering robust and diverse intellectual links within and beyond ecology and conservation biology. Their work has substantially expanded the boundaries of both disciplines. Professor Levin developed the theoretical underpinnings of spatial ecology. He deftly uses mathematical modeling to link local dynamics with landscape patterns, effectively uniting the reductionist and holistic perspectives on ecological systems. His contributions to ecology continue to evolve with more recent research on the interface between ecology and economics and how socioeconomic mechanisms, if properly designed, may modify ecosystems in sustainable ways that encourage biodiversity conservation. Levin's work has demonstrated how the coupling of human natural systems determines the variable regime shifts whose identification is fundamental in forecasting irrevocable change. Professor Farig has developed theory-driven and data-proven ways for effectively reducing the effects of habitat loss through connectivity conservation. Farig's approach has enabled investigations into the consequences of habitat connectivity and fragmentation, whereby habitat is broken up into smaller patches due to human impact on landscapes. This process is now considered to be one of the most profound threats to biodiversity. Her work has extended spatial theory into the complex dimensions of real-world landscapes, most notably by recognizing the critical role that road networks and small conservation areas play in altering the distribution and abundance of species. Dr. Pickett has applied spatial ecology theory to coupled human natural systems and developed the field of urban ecology. Pickett has been a pioneer of the important work of integrating humans as components of ecosystems into ecological theory. He has been particularly effective in linking ecology and urban design and bringing ethical and philosophical perspectives into the study of human dominated ecosystems. Pickett's work has characterized the dynamism that reflects the reality of complex ecosystems and landscapes in an, area of, in an era of increasing urbanization and changing climate with significant applications in the management and restoration of diverse ecosystems. We recognize this trio of scientists for their independent and collective efforts to understand ecosystems as complex systems with dynamics and behavior that are more than the sum of their component parts. In addition, their collective efforts have pushed ecology and conservation biology into a truly multidisciplinary endeavor. They have all implemented analytical methods to address ecological problems emerging at the human wildlife interface at scales ranging from roadsides to continents. Congratulations to this year's winners. Could you explain what your work has revealed about the consequences of habitat fragmentation and how the connectivity between small conservation areas can preserve biodiversity? Okay, so most uh, species require at least some amount of natural habitat to persist uh, in the wild. And uh, so our research and also other people's research has shown that 
uh, the loss of natural habitat is probably the most important cause of the current biodiversity um, decline, the current biodiversity crisis. So there's the loss of natural habitat. And then uh, there is this concept of the fragmentation of habitat. And starting about 40 years ago, there was this idea that in addition to the loss of habitat, uh, the fragmentation of habitat um, is also a problem for biodiversity. So if you can imagine, um, say, you want to protect some habitat, let's say you're a government or a conservation organization and you want to protect, say, a total of a thousand hectares of forest. Um, you could protect that thousand hectares of forest in one big block of a thousand hectares or in say 10 smaller blocks of 100 hectares each. And it was assumed starting about 40 years ago that it would be better for biodiversity if we were to protect the one big block of 1,000 hectares. And uh, so what my research has, has shown over the past 30 years is that in fact that assumption probably isn't correct. That it's at least as valuable to biodiversity if we are to protect uh, 10 100 hectare blocks of forest as if we were to protect uh, 1,000 1, 1, hectare block of forest. So the, the effects of fragmentation, in addition to or separate from the effects of habitat loss, are actually not negative the way people have assumed. And this is actually really important for biodiversity conservation because what it means is that uh, it's important to protect the small bits of habitat as well as the big ones. So uh, in areas where you have had a lot of habitat loss, which again is the biggest impact, but where you have had a lot of loss of natural habitats, what you tend to have left is small bits of habitat. And if we assume that uh, only big areas of habitat are valuable, then we don't actually provide protection for those small areas of habitat. And that is really counterproductive from a biodiversity protection perspective. We really need to uh, start protecting even the small areas of habitat. Uh, so that's the, um, the issue of habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. Um, in addition to habitat loss, um, there is also the issue of uh, what's called connectivity among bits of habitat or areas of habitat. And so this is the idea that uh, uh, species, species will, some species, for example, need to have more than one kind of habitat to persist. So you could think of, for example, uh, the leopard frog, which will uh, reproduce in ponds or uh, wet areas along the sides of a uh, river or a lake. And, uh, and then they will go and spend the summer foraging in meadows, you know, for foraging for insects in meadows. So they have two distinct kinds of habitat that they need to survive, which means they have to move between them in order to, for that population to continue. So, um, so it's important for them to be able to do that. So connectivity is this idea that um, if you think of a landscape, so when we think about a landscape, I, I usually imagine you're looking down from an airplane and it's kind of what you see below you. What does that look like? And so you can imagine that you could have a landscape with uh, two kinds of habitat in it where it would be easy for the leopard frog to get between them and another setup where uh, it would be difficult. And uh, because of the things that we've done, you know, things that we've put between. For example, uh, we have found that um, landscapes, agricultural landscapes with small crop fields in them um, have much higher biodiversity in general than agricultural landscapes with big crop fields. And that's probably at least partly because the animals have much more difficulty getting across a really big, you know, soybean field without dying essentially um, than across small ones where they would have refuge in the edges of the fields. And so they'd be able to sort of um, get through the landscape by going across the small fields much more easily than by going across really big crop fields. So that's one example. Uh, so this is the idea of, of connectivity. This is something that, um, actually, I guess it was my master's uh, thesis that it, with my master's thesis supervisor, Gray Merriam, that we published in 1985, a paper talking about 
landscape connectivity. So the, the basic point is that what we, uh, so we have the habitat, the natural habitat that's important, but it's also important because species need uh, to leave habitat, uh, natural habitats often. And so it's important that they, um, the, they don't, they can survive uh, when they go between different habitats. And, and, and so, yeah, that's the, the idea of, of landscape connectivity. The jury has granted you this award for developing the theoretical underpinnings of spatial, spatial ecological through your work. Could you explain how you did so and why it's so important? One of the greatest challenges facing our societies is the loss of biological diversity. Biological diversity is fundamental to us. In order to understand what's at risk and in order to understand what we can do about it, we have to understand the mechanisms that maintain biological diversity. That indeed has been a central theme in ecological theory for a century. But until recently, there wasn't much mathematical theory that began to incorporate the spatial dimensions of species interactions into models. And so I set out in the 1970s, actually, to begin to build models that built spatial structure into the sorts of ecological models that people were considering. And that eventually led to the work that the jury kindly rewarded me with this wonderful prize. Your work in ecology is theoretical, but has also been applied to design criteria for reserve areas and conservation policies. Can you provide examples of how your work has found applications for precise problems in ecology? So mathematical theories such as I um, do in my work have been fundamental to uh, problems of reserve design uh, and um, but also much more broadly, much more generally, to a range of environmental problems that we're facing. Uh, in particular, all of these systems are what are called complex adaptive systems in which individual actions by pe people, in particular, affect the environment uh, and have consequences that we're f living with, like climate change, the loss of biodiversity, and outbreaks of infectious diseases. In order to address these problems, we need the theoretical foundations. We've learned this with, as we struggle with trying to control the, the COVID pandemic. And in particular, we need to learn how to cooperate in addressing the public goods problems, the problems of the commons, that are essential to our maintaining the ecological systems that are so crucial to, to us. And therefore, I've become working much more closely with economists, with social scientists, and with um, people in particular in the business sector who have to understand the, the nature of these problems and have to understand that business must, uh, industry must be partners in solving these problems. And so I've been working closely with uh, people from various aspects of the business sector um, who, are, who are trying to implement uh, some of the, the essential steps that will be needed to achieve sustainability. Society seems to be much more conscious of how serious the global biodiversity crisis is but the rate at which species disappear continues to the increase. Can this problem be solved and what fundamental steps should be taken to confront it? We have no choice but to believe that we can solve this problem. We can help solve uh, this problem because we're, we've already done damage through the things I mentioned, climate change and loss of biodiversity. But I firmly believe that um, it's not too late. 
for us to, uh, to take the necessary steps, uh, but we don't have a lot of time to lose. And uh, what do we have to do? Well, we have to get the message across, um, as I mentioned to the business sector, we have to get the message across to, to political leaders. And the only way we're going to get that message across is if we get the message across uh, to people um, who will make their wishes known to decision makers. So scientists I, have a special responsibility not only to do the work, but to take the message um, to the, the public, to get the message out. And, and I'm hoping that the recognition of, uh, of the importance of this through, for example, uh, the BBVA awards and, and, and other venues will begin to make people realize that we cannot just sit back and hope others will solve the problem for us. We have to address these problems. We have to believe we can solve them. We have to understand uh, that in order to do that, we're, is gonna, we're, we're going to need to find ways to cooperate uh, across political boundaries and across international boundaries. Could you explain how you have applied spatial ecology theory to urban design and what your central findings have been in this field? Actually, I like that question a lot because of the how. And I have to say right away that I've done this by collaborating with urban designers and urban planners. So my thinking in this area is very much a part of a dialogue with those professionals and practitioners. I have tried to bring ecological thinking about the dynamics of space into the dialogue with urban planners and designers. And so what that means is that I think about cities as patchworks, and they're patchworks layered of many kinds. So there's the, the built environment, there are the buildings, there are the roads, there's the infrastructure, but there's also a landscape or a patchwork of of policy and, and regulations and norms. And then, of course, there's a, a layer that deals with people's social difference, difference in class and ethnicity and so on. And then finally, there's a layer that pulls out the green, the ecological parts of cities, what's going on in terms of nutrient cycling and regulation of climate and flows of water. And so I've tried to deal with planning from those perspectives, pulling that all together, thinking about cities as patchworks that are both physical, biological, and social. And I've found a great deal of sympathy in the planning professions and design professions for those kinds of views. In fact, Planners and designers are some of the most spatially aware people that I know. So there's a lot of sympathy, and it's a really great way to have that dialogue and get these ecological thoughts into the planning, into planning theory and planning practice. Could you give us some examples of the way your research has already been applied to the design of greener cities? One of the things that I can point to there is some of the long-term work that I've been involved in in Baltimore. And that's a big team of people and a big metropolitan area, five counties plus the city of Baltimore. And one of the things that people in cities have been thinking is that to improve the quality of water in streams, to reduce the runoff from the surfaces, the impervious surfaces into streams, that one of the things that you can do is plant trees, plant vegetation in the riparian zones, the zones right along the streams. And it's been found in the wild and in agricultural situations that vegetation right along streams is crucially important to reducing the pollution that gets, gets into streams. What we found in, in Baltimore, which has been found in other cities as well now, surprised us. We found that the riparian areas weren't actually performing that expected function because the, the uh, water tables had been drawn down because of the way that water is piped from the surfaces into the streams. And so that meant that when we had a dialogue with the city 
uh, managers and policymakers, they said, wow, this is a, a big surprise. What do we do about this? And so together we came up with the idea, well, let's think about the whole city as a riparian zone. Let's think about the whole city as something you could design to absorb water, to slow down runoff, to capture excess nitrogen and that sort of thing. And so that's one of the things that, that was our, one of our first discoveries. And in fact, in many cities, people have been doing that. It, it's an official policy in Baltimore and in the state of Maryland. They now use the methods that we used to discover these kinds of things in, in Baltimore and use them throughout the state. Another thing that has happened in, in our research is discovering that green infrastructure, which we all think is a really useful thing in cities, you have to be very careful that green infrastructure doesn't put some people at an advantage, at a disadvantage. There's sometimes when green infrastructure is installed and it's put under the control or the management of communities. Well, that's fine if you're dealing with a wealthy community where people have lots of time. It's not such a good thing if you're dealing with a community that, where people have multiple jobs, they don't have a lot of time to devote to managing the local green space. So we have pointed to the idea that equitability of how you manage green space has to be accounted for. So it's not just the ecology, but it's the fairness of how green infrastructure is, is being practiced. So those are two examples of how the research that I've been involved in has improved or changed how management, design, planning actually goes on in cities. Looking into the future, what would be your vision for how cities should be designed in a manner which respects the environment? That is a really, really important question. Right now, if you look at cities around the world, you see that they're really designed for cars. They're designed for automobiles, for the convenience of, of motorized transport. And I think we need to flip that around and really to think about cities as being not only places that have to move materials and people around efficiently, but also in places in which biology has to function, biodiversity has to prosper and perform functions that are useful for climate control, water control, and even for people's health, psychologically and, say, heat stress are two, two big reasons. So I think we need to sort of turn around our order of what we think about when we design cities. Design cities first for people and nature together. Let the transport, let the sort of physical efficiency or the moving around of things be lower down in the list. Not absent from the list, but I think we need to reorder the priority so that we get cities to have joint ecological, social, and engineering qualities. That's, I think, a really good way to do it.